All right. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Uh, it's 6.40. We will reconvene the public portion of our meeting. We'll start with 3.1, Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, four point one approval of the agenda for April eighth, twenty twenty four. Is there so a motion? Moved. Second? Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Hammers, would you please call the roll? Yes. Austin? Aye. Lissett? Aye. Gilmore? Aye. Imes? Aye. Lail Wolf? Aye. Mars? Aye. Miller. Aye. That is six I votes. I mean seven I votes. Thank you. Um, 5.1 President's comments. Public comments will occur during the public comments portion of the meeting. The board will not allow interruption during the meeting, but if you're interested in addressing the board, please fill out the required public participation at board meetings form and submit it to Ms. Hammers. Please email your name, phone number, and topic of discussion or agenda item to Board of Education, uh, to BOE at sps186.org if you wish to participate via telephone. And then we will move to 5.2, which is the student report. Mr. Harrison Gray. All right. Good evening, everyone. Joining you hot off the heels from my last District 186 spring break. It's a little sad, but it means we're close. So on March 22nd, we were able to do something really unique with the help of the Citizens Club of Springfield. Uh, students from our own Landfield, uh, Southeast, and Springfield High Schools, in addition to a representative from Sacred Heart Ridley, joined the club for a panel discussion that I had the opportunity to moderate. It went very well, especially with the help of our district administrative team and the support of President Miller and Superintendent Gill in the audience. Uh, a recording of the event is available on the NPR Illinois uh, Facebook page if anyone is interested. Uh, I hope any, every, everyone enjoyed their spring break uh, as we now push into the final weeks of school. Uh, this Wednesday will be SAT and PSAT testing for Southeast and Springfield High. My advice, which has been shared with me many times from other teachers in the district, is to get a good night's sleep, stay well hydrated, and bring snacks for your testing day. A favorable SAT score is still very significant to many colleges, and if you don't like your first score, you can always try again. That's all I have. Excellent. Um, and it was a very robust conversation at the Citizens Club. I didn't realize it was also your grandfather's birthday. So <laughs> yes. it was a very yes, nice way to honor somebody for what they've done for the community. Is there any uh, discussion for Mr. Gray? Okay, well, thank you for the report. Uh, we'll turn it over to the superintendent for 6.1. Superintendent Gill. All right, thank you. All right, well, we're pretty proud of the Blackhawk Elementary School fifth grade students. They, were earned, they earned the opportunity to go and compete in the engineering open house event over at the University of Illinois um, at Champaign. After taking second place at the 17th annual Springfield area fifth grade Rube Goldberg, Goldberg competition in March, the bees had a great time at the competition and they finished second overall at the nice. event. Nice. That's wow. huge. That's from across the state. Thanks a lot for our engineering in the classroom program here in Springfield and to the amazing uh, Blackhawk Bees. We're very proud of you and it's, it's a pretty big deal. Second place is, is quite good. I so got to see their, um, their, their little contract. creation um, when they were at Lincoln Land uh -huh. and that thing ran flawlessly every single time because they have to run it like so many times within like a, um, a 10 minute mm -hmm. spiel and yeah, they have to give a speech game. and all of that. Um, <laughs> There it is. <laughs> now we're kicking it up. <laughs> I see Eclipse Day. I know. I will say to uh, Miss Blissett's point, I, I missed their presentation, but I was there to watch several of the others, and I believe it was um, everybody had to do a piece of bread or making toast. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So you have to. 
insert the bread into the toaster. And it, it was pretty uh, interesting to see all the different creative um, displays. So, yeah. I was at Lincoln Land as well. I did not get to see it up close, but I went to the school when they presented to some of the other classes and got to see it up close and personal. And it's pretty amazing what they were able to do. Uh, Lisa Schweska is the teacher who, um, who put that together, that presentation together. And uh, it was impressive. And I thank the um, engineers of Central Illinois for uh, taking time to work with our students. Too. Yeah. The other thing, too, is Stephanie McCorkle, the principal there, it was a STEM robotics teacher at Jefferson when she was teaching. So that's kind of a nice carryover. You see her there in the picture helping, helping the students over at U of I. So it's pretty cool. Good stuff. All right, moving on. Uh, All City Music Festival, it was and I'm not lying, it was amazing. The talent in this district and the way it pulled together with all of the guest uh, conductors, it was just really amazing to hear and see. Um, it's band and all of our choral programs at our middle and high schools uh, coming together. The auditorium was packed at Sangamon Auditorium. And once again, a great thing for our community to see and get our, get our talent out there. I think we're kind of over that bump now of kids who didn't play instruments during COVID time. And now we've got a lot of people going out. And just huge kudos to Amy Mensch, who's our coordinator for fine arts, and her work with developing a fifth grade band program that I think will only help us accelerate even further. Uh, so we're, we're really excited about how we can even grow that next year to fourth grade or more fifth graders uh, to participate. I was able to be at the All City Music Festival, and it was amazing. I chatted with a young student at uh, Southeast Kalen, and she said her favorite class, the favorite reason for being at uh, Southeast is uh, the choir, and uh, the choir classes. And so that's something that we have to encourage uh, with the kids. And I um, am pleased to see the improvements since my kids were in school when they would have All City Music Festival every other year in the armor. And so this is yeah, a huge improvement to, to be doing it. At, so at this is just like a, a fun Jennifer Gale growing up thing, but my mom used to be an orchestra teacher in the district, and I have pictures of her at the arm, armory performing with the orchestra when she was probably, I don't know, my daughter's age, 23, 24. So it was pretty cool um, to have those memories as well. Um, but the every other year thing is thank you to the Springfield Public Schools Foundation because they help pay the bill so that we can utilize Sangamon Auditorium. Um, it's pretty awesome. Thank you for saying that. All right, moving on. We've got some busy weeks with drama coming up. We have um, Southeast <coughs> is going to perform Clue, uh, the high school edition, on April 20th and 21st. And it's in Southeast uh, newly renovated auditorium. So they've been having a lot of fun. I was backstage the other day, tripping over all the sets. They are ready to go. So it is looking great. Uh, Springfield High is presenting the teen edition of Chicago on April 26th, 27th, and 28th in the Schneering Auditorium at Springfield High. Uh, so we have a lot of, of great events coming up. The students that are involved in this are way more than just the students who perform on stage, the students who did the sets, students who are helping with the lighting and the setup and the clothing and the costumes. and. We have a lot of community members too that are helping. I think Deb, you helped a little bit with Southeast as well, so thank you for that. Um, but we're really excited for these two uh, performances coming up back-to-back uh, -back weekends. We have a Thriving Families and 186 event coming up April 23rd, 6 to 8 o'clock at Southeast. We're using their commons area. Child care is available. And just to ex explain Thriving Families, we're developing kind of a restorative network in our community and looking at ways to get uh, parents involved and get support in our community. And here's some lessons learned from Dr. DeMond Holt. He's a traumatologist. I had to practice saying that a few times, but that is a new field of science and, and, and medical about how when we have trauma in our lives, how our brain is affected by that. And us realizing that in ourselves and being able to uh, ask for help at the right times and sort of uh, breaking down the barriers and the walls uh, that exist um, because of trauma that's happened in their lives. And I'd like to give a shout out to Jamar Scott who helped set up all of these events and also Terrence Jordan at the back. We're kind of combining it with our face group. 
so it's it, it was great. The first event was absolutely amazing, and we really filled the entire auditorium uh, with people that come and listen to Dr. Holt. And he is he will keep you on your toes the whole presentation. It's not a lecture whatsoever. He's a good one. And Jennifer, I heard him speak a couple of weeks ago, and he yeah. he was so uplifting. For IMRAC, yes. Yeah. yeah. He's the same presenter that did um, Black Trauma at for IMRAC, right? and we've got round two coming up for that. When is that again? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Good deal. We'll get lots of information out about that. Yep. All right. Excellent. Okay. The best part of my job is when we can bring in new educators and teachers to our community. I just wanted to give a shout out for our District 186 Career Fair, uh, Wednesday, April 17th at the district office, which is at 3063 Fiat Avenue, where you stood at could see us all standing in the parking lot with really funny glasses today uh, watching the eclipse and enjoying that um, and our schools had a great time with it uh, they were teachable moments whether they were watching it on TV or outside with the glasses um, we had a lot of fun uh, passing out the glasses to everybody and making sure everybody had a successful view and safe view of the eclipse and that will be from 9 to 1 o'clock um, at Fiat for the career fair and then 4 to 6 o'clock also um, and so we want to make sure that we, we have all of those things um, ready to roll. Uh, before I turn it over to our school uh, presentation tonight, which is the highlight, I do just want to take a quick moment of silence uh, for Karen Holmes Hagen. Um, she used to, her name when she was working here at district office with Karen Holmes Hall, uh, you may remember her, she was the board secretary. So she sat in Julie's seat for many, many years, a good friend to many of us, and she retired in 2008. So if we could take a moment of silence for Karen, I would appreciate it. Thank you, and just keep her family. She has three daughters and some stepchildren. Uh, many of uh, the grandchildren attend District 186 schools, so I know it's been a difficult time. All right, that's all I have for my report, and I will go ahead and call up Hazel Dell. We are excited to hear about what Hazel Dell is up to. Hazel I will say that um, before I became principal of Hazel Dell, I didn't know much that about it except that it was the little school down the street from where I lived from, and I was like, oh Lord, if I could just get this school. So God bless me with Hazel Dell, the best kept secret in Springfield, and I keep saying that. Um, next slide. Um, so, Hazel, now, I, one of the things that we focus on, we focus on just not just academics, but we focus on academics, behavior, and attendance. And so, one of our highlights is that our math scores from fall to winter, we, we grew 10% just from fall to winter with the math scores. And one of the things that I want to say that is a contributing factor is the new curriculum. So, thank you all for adopting that new curriculum. Our children are more engaged. They enjoy math. If you walk into the classroom, you actually hear children talking about math. We have students who do not want to miss school because they don't want to miss their math class. So I do, we do contribute a lot of that growth to the new curriculum, data days, and then we do have targeted interventions. Like we're not just doing interventions just to be doing interventions. We're targeting to where the students' weaknesses are and that is helping improve in the classroom. And then we have tutoring. Um, one of our newer teachers, Dr. Sassy, she actually started what she called the Digit Club. And it was, we ended up having a waiting list because children were trying to get into the Digit Club where they actually did practice math. And they were excited about it. And so when, <clears throat> when we paused it, they were really upset because they really enjoyed Digit Club. But then another thing that's great about Hazeldale is that this year, we have probably had 94 just classroom office discipline referrals, only 59 office discipline referrals for the year. 74% of our students have no office discipline referrals, nice. and then 21% of our students fall in between that one through five. And one of the, the main contributing um, factors to that is that we have strong classroom management and their procedures and policies. And if someone needs assistance, we have a team of people that will help. In, that, in those areas. And then attendance. So about two-thirds of our, our students are at school 90% of the time. 
And so that's really good because that all of that contributes to them being able to learn and we plan to see some more growth as long as we can keep the children in school. And so one of the contributing factors to that is that we do have attendance incentives. They get field trips, they get popcorn on Fridays, they get out of the blues just for being at school. But we also have a targeted focus on chronic absenteeism. I have a wonderful face, um, family and a community engagement liaison, and she actually goes out, home visits. If, if a child has been chronically absent and a parent calls in, she says, I'll come pick them up. And so, she, so she'll go out, pick them up, my secretary will pick them up, my social worker will go. So one of the things is that we want to make sure that children are in school. And then I want to highlight some other things. I have two teachers I wanted to highlight. Next slide, please. Two teachers that I really want to highlight, and that's my fourth and fifth grade teachers. And they teach a fourth and fifth grade split. So Dr. Sassy, if you see at the top, she teaches them fourth and fifth grade math. And if you see the students, this is how they are all the time. They are totally engaged in their math in their math class, and you'll go in there, they're teaching, they're talking, they're challenging each other, you know, they're asking each other to explain because that's part of our targeted learning focus is being able to support your thinking. So they're asking that why. And then we have Ms. Warren, and Ms. Warren is the model of relational capacity. She gives up her lunch hour, she gives up after school, anything that she needs to do to make sure that the students get what they need. And so she's tutoring, she's helping them with their life experiences, she's helping them with their social emotional learning. So I just want to highlight my fourth and my fifth grade um, teachers because they're doing an excellent job with the students. And then, next slide, our students. I, I chose two particular students because these are fifth grade students, so they will be leaving us and going into the middle school. But we have first Mr. Ryder Campbell. Campbell, he is one of the most improved math students that we have. He, um, I was in the classroom and I was working out a math problem, and he actually stood behind me monitoring what I was doing, <laughs> making sure that I was doing it correctly. And then we have Miss Jaslyn Jones, and she is actually, she was actually the winner of the Dr. Martin Luther King essay contest. And so, the, and so, and yes, please give her. A hand. about Jaslyn and she didn't like to come to school so she her attendance wasn't great but you know she got that she got that wind beneath her wings when she won that um, contest and Miss Warren worked with her you know had her rewrite her essay talk about her essay read her essay and those different things so I wanted to highlight those are two of my fifth graders who will be leaving us this year next slide and then, when I talk about Hazeldale, I cannot talk about Hazeldale without talking about our families. I mean, we have, literally, and I'm not just bragging, we have the best families in the district. I mean, they are so supportive. You know, anything that we ask, they show up, they come to family nights, they come to early in, early in the morning, um, mom's breakfast, dad's breakfast, grandparents, we, had, we just had an out of the blue grandparents day, we had nowhere to put everyone, <laughs> they were all there. And so we have great families, they, they really do show up for their children. And then, the next slide is our partners. We have, we have had the pleasure of partnering with some great community um, outreach programs. Pleasant Grove Baptist Church has been one of our primary partners, and Dr. Rosser has been a mentor, he's one of our real men reads, he sends the church members over to volunteer for our family nights. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, they actually provide the CHIP program where they give food for the weekends to some of our students. And so that has been a wonderful program. Our children love to do it. Say, when we call them down, they can't wait to come and get their, change their bags and get their new bags. And so they really enjoy that program. Cherry Hills Church donated $2,500 to whatever we wanted to do for the children wow. at the school. We have a long-standing partnership with Woodside Township, and each year they give they um, donate $500 to anything that, that's safety-related. We have Sigma Gamma Road Sorority Incorporated. They did a, a school supply drive, so we have a resource room full of school supplies donated by Sigma Gamma Road Sorority Incorporated. The Boys and Girls Club with our 21st Century, and then Pilgrim Rest Missionary Baptist Church actually chose a day to um, to shine their light on our teachers, and they provided breakfast for our teachers. 
just for being who they are and being in the classroom. So we've had a lot going on at Hazeldale. We love Hazeldale. I mean, and next slide. It's just our our gallery. But one of the highlights of this year, we actually had a basketball team with cheerleaders and basketball players and games at Hazeldale. And I'm from middle school, so it, was, it wasn't a big deal to me. And then I was like, this is a lot for elementary, but they enjoyed it. <laughs> the families enjoyed it. And so it was a great experience, not just for our students, but for our families as well. And it was another way that we can bring the families in and to support the school. So I say we are Hazeldale, the district's best kept secret. Thank you. Thank you. Principal Burris, Principal Burris, oh, okay. yeah, I, I can comedy. attest to Hazeldale being uh, the best kept secret. As my niece, who I have custody of, her name is Erica as well, goes to that school and she, um, she those genres but um hey Zodell, it's definitely a big a big big family um and i'm just happy that um we are part of that you are doing an excellent job so are the teachers everyone who works there like i said it's just it actually is a big family when she says there's room where, where, where we're going to go it's always packed at Hazel when he has events it's always packed so um keep up the good work i know little erica is very very excited and we, we cherish that school and I do want to say that for IAR, the students were really confident. Um, for fourth and fifth grade, almost every day of our IAR testing, we had 100% attendance in those grade levels. Nice. So they do want to be there, and they're feeling more confident about their learning. So. Crossing our fingers, huh? Good job. Good job. Mr. All right, and next up we have <laughs> Mrs. Kenyatta Ravel, mm -hmm. principal at Isles School, to share about the Isles journey. <laughs> Watch this yeah. All right. I love good hugging in the aisles. <laughs> they used to work together. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Superintendent Gill and board members. And it's just such a pleasure to be here tonight in front of all of you to present. I love that I got to do it the same night as Tiffany. We were right there hand in hand together working. So it's really fun to be here with her. I've been her mentor for a couple of years. So uh, so great to see her work. Uh, next slide, please. Let me just try it one more time. Thank you. There we go. So we were asked to come and, and give some celebrations about our school report card. So the, I wanted to highlight a couple of things, one being the number of IELTS students to meet and or exceed the standards for the IAR was more than double of that of the state in both ELA and math, and that 90.3% of our students scored in the meets or exceeds standards for science. I also wanted to highlight that our IAR ELA scores increased by 4.5%, and our IAR scores increased, our math scores increased by 2.8 um, this last year. But more than that, we're always trying to look for our bubble children and we want more of our students to exceed. So we actually were able to move 5% of our students from meets to exceeds. Um, and we have seen growth in both ELA and math since 2001, 5% uh, in ELA, 13.7% in math. And uh, the last highlight is 100% of our 8th graders scored in the meets or exceed category for their high AR in ELA. So I'll just talk. What's working? I was really glad to hear Tiffany talk about um, the math curriculum. And um, we had an opportunity. We all have facilitators. And one of my facilitators came back, uh, and they were doing a book study called Building Thinking Classrooms and Mathematics. And she came back, and I have never seen a teacher come back from a PD 
so enthusiastic, so excited to learn. And she just got me so excited that I actually went and joined the book study. And it was just a different way of thinking. And we pride ourselves in trying to do the best, the most innovative. However, just the, the building thinking classrooms was just a really phenomenal, you know, not having students sit, having students collaborate, having them work with non-permanent spaces. And just that was such a real aha. And we have just really had some excitement around that. In addition to that, um, the district provides us with access to uh, exact path, which we think is uh, really a good tool because it takes every child and gives them their exact pathway so that when they're studying and working and learning, we've been really trying to be committed to giving our students extra time on their exact path. So we feel like that's been working. We um, also looked at our reading and writing scores and really felt like um, our teachers really wanted to look at writing a little differently. So we took and decided we would focus on six traits of writing. And we actually had a professional author, award-winning author, Shannon Anderson, come in. She gave PD, and we um, and, and she visited, shared her books. And it was just showing the teachers how you can uh, teach writing in such a fun way and connecting it with a real author and giving them that real love of, you can do this too. We um, also had have a reading tutor who works with first graders mostly, but some of our second and third graders who are in need about three days a week. So that's something else we think has been working. And then obviously we're an IB school, International Baccalaureate School, and so we get findings from the organization, and one of those was just really looking at, from, at assessment and um, everything that that could do for us and what we could do better. So we, we really had a workshop that came to us, and we really learned a lot. I had all but four teachers that were able to present, uh, to, to be a part of that in the summer. Our targeted learning focus is all IELTS students can think, say, write, read, and communicate their ideas. And that's not just in, um, in, in reading or writing, that's in everything. Next slide, <laughs> Well, today was a really busy day, um, having the solar eclipse again, <laughs> you know, and I didn't think uh, in 2017 that I would be doing this yet again. Although I can say now that we had the experience uh, this year, the last time it was the very first day of school, if you remember, and that was a very big challenge. So we kind of knew a little bit more about what we were doing. We had almost an army of parents that came out and um, actually got the children to go out one, one by one, one adult to one child, and then um, managed to make that happen today. So I'm a little tired, but <laughs> it was really great. I wanted to say we also, this is the year of the dragon. And so if you look in that first picture, uh, we had our first <coughs> dragon making event. It was really successful. Um, I think when he started, he said, oh, I hope to get, you know, 100 people. I'm sure we had over 250 people there. It was packed. And many of the board members were at the event and, and superintendent. So we really thank you for coming out. Uh, Real Men Read is just a phenomenal program. I want to thank Mr. Jordan for making that happen for all the schools this year. So we are participating in that for our third graders. And then we had um, News Channel 20 guest readers. Uh, again, thank you, Mr. Jordan, for that. <laughs> One of the really phenomenal things is we believe in educating the whole child. So we love the idea of having 31 entries in the solo and ensemble. And of those 31, 25 of those students received a first and the others received a second, which is really phenomenal for elementary school. <laughs> and middle school. But a lot of those students were elementary students. Um, in, and as far as the ILMEA, we have for the whole district, um, and I guess there's nine districts that participate in ILMEA, right? 
pardon me, <laughs> but but uh, we had the our, one of our students placed first for trumpet, so that was really a phenomenal reward for her. And then we have students, obviously, with Scholastic Art Awards. We had the middle school speech contest, which is really like acting, and that was really cool. We had students that could uh, participate in our, our first Lego League, and they went to state, so that was nice. We have Starter Strings Back, which we think is a phenomenal program, so we're happy to have that. The next one was just so exciting. Uh, Ms. Eric Austin came to our school, choreographed a dance for Black History Month, and uh, we had about 20 students that are there in the black t-shirts as conquerors, and they uh, danced and in about four sessions just really mastered a phenomenal piece, and so that was a lot of fun. We had students who entered, I think we had about eight students that entered the regional science fair and about five of those are going on. Two of them got special awards. And we have a brand new playground at Isles. <laughs> and included in that playground, we have um, some new green space and we have a teacher that is extremely dedicated to our gardens. So we now have about four gardens. One of those being a community vegetable garden uh, where it's open to the community, anyone, when we're planting in the summer, anyone can come over and get what they want uh, when things are available. We also now are certified butterfly garden, so um, we have, uh, we're on the route, if you look up butterflies. And we have a micro pantry, and this year we decided that we really wanted to make sure it continued to stay full. It's used every day, and so by grade levels, um, students decided they would take that action and make sure it was filled. We had 96, which is the largest we've ever had, um, play in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. So 96 students, the bottom picture shows that. It was really a great time. Next slide. I just wanted to share our vision, and that's at Isle School, that we create a rigorous global learning environment where students will become active, lifelong learners by using their skills to explore their passions. If you look, that's a picture of the fifth graders in their capstone project. All PYP XIB schools, all the students in their final year of elementary have to present a project that they care about. And um, this year, we're so excited, the mayor came to visit because some of our students would um, interview her for their project. And Ms. Gilmore, so you're in here too. <laughs> All right, and uh, just talking about the welcoming experience. Um, if, if you take a look, and just like Tiffany talked about all her wonderful families, I feel the same about mine. Um, they are wonderful. I, I think today was a real testament to that because we put that all call out and they just showed up and it was just so helpful to have them. Um, basketball, you talked about basketball. Intramural basketball is a big, big, event at Isle School and we had um, I think an additional 20 teams this year so it was a lot of a lot of teams um, that were able to play and that's just a little glimpse of the new playground um, those were the channel 20 readers and there's our community garden and just a snippet of the book fair which is another big event for us so again thank you so much for your time and and I'm happy to be here Thank you, Mrs. Rebell. Always exciting. Thank you both for coming tonight and sharing the love. I felt the love yes. in those schools, and our kids need us like that. They need everything to bring them full circle and to make sure that they have a welcoming environment in every step of the way during the day. So thank you so much again. Yeah, no, it's, it's awesome to see all the uh, community partnerships and just how the families rally around these neighborhood schools. Uh, absolutely love the energy, and I will give a shout out to uh, WICS. You're not always the topic of conversation at our board meeting, but uh, thank you for so many people who've come out to District 186 to help. Uh, we'll have SJR next, right? We'll be out there reading in classrooms. <laughs> All right. Is there any other discussion? Well, I'm good for tonight. Okay. Any questions? 
I actually have one question. Mm -hmm. sure. When she brought up the community garden, which I think is amazing, and I know Butler has a community <coughs> garden. Do we, can we get a list of our like schools that have okay. community gardens? I think that would be great to get out on our websites for, for people to know, like Mr. Miller said, how invested in our neighborhoods that our schools are. and no. Because I know there's more than just those two, but those are the two that I... No, off the top of my head. Yeah, Wilcox has been Wilcox. getting more together, too. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, that would be good I'll information. Yep. I don't know them off the top of my head. I know. Head, <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get that info. Thank you. You know, Buffy, to piggyback on that would also be which schools have micro pantries and little yep. libraries outside, yep. too. All yep. right, that sounds And like the butterfly garden survey. was a new one for me. Do we have other butterfly gardens around? Because I might just go mm -hmm. sit. If you see me on the school grounds mm -hmm. sitting at the butterfly garden, like, don't. Don't call security. <laughs> I love a good butterfly garden. I'll All right. On that note, is there any other discussion? Okay. Thank you, everybody, for the presentations. Thank you for the report, Superintendent. Sure. Uh, brings us to discussion item 7.1, old business. Does any board member have any old business? I have old business that I think is really new business, but you keep telling me to put it on old business. Well, we can go to 7.2 new business. <laughs> Does any board member have any new business? <laughs> so I have the IASB uh, uh, talking points for April. Uh, just a couple things. The new board president's academy. So there's a board president academy that takes place uh, in three locations across our state in June and August. They're open to board presidents, board vice presidents, and future board presidents. So um, there'll be a link that I'm going to have Ms. Hammer send you all that any board member um, who has... Uh, been in these roles or aspires to be in these roles can attend these academies. Um, and like I said, they are held in, I think one's down in Collinsville, is that correct? I know one's in Collinsville, one's up in the northern part of the state, and maybe one's in Peoria. I, I, I'd have to double check, but, um, but there'll be a link that you can go and check that out. Um, and then the governing board meetings take place in May and June, um, and they just sent those out What's today? Monday? So they just sent that out last Thursday or Friday, I think. The one for the Abe Lincoln uh, region is May 23rd at 6 p.m., and that's at in um, Sherman, um, and it's a $25 fee. So if you're interested in that, there's a registration, and that link will be included in the email that gets forwarded to you. The joint annual conference for 2024, that registration opens on June 3rd. Um, so you can uh, start thinking about that and getting your calendars um cleared and present for that. When is that conference? Do you have the dates or no? I probably do. It's usually the weekend before Thanksgiving, yeah. right? Yes. Hang on. Please the weekend before Thanksgiving? Yeah. Okay. Always. Usually. Okay. November 22nd through November 24th, 2024. Wow, Thanksgiving's late. <laughs> so Thanksgiving must be the following Thursday. Thanksgiving's yeah. very late. Yeah. Don't want to get your turkeys weird weird to observation really. to make on a right. board meeting. But. <laughs> All right. Um, press Plus or and Press, the issue 114 is going to be released, was released actually last week, March 27th, I think it was. Yes. So, um, and that registration, to, the webinar is actually tomorrow. And if you didn't like hop on and get registered to watch that webinar tomorrow at noon, um, you can still catch it. Um, like they'll have on-demand viewing like a week after. They'll get it all up on the website and you can watch it there. So that is all I have. Thank you. All right. Excellent report. Um, is there any other discussion? Any other new business? Okay, hearing none, that brings us to 8.1 public comment. The Board of Education and I encourage public comment and public participation in board meetings. However, it is inappropriate for any person to name a student or an individual employee, including designating an employee by job title rather than name an open session. If any public commenter wants to address issues related to an individual student or a District 186 employee, that commenter is invited to contact the board office or a member of the cabinet prior to public comment. It is not the intention of the board to discourage public comment in any way, rather it is the intention of the board to address issues regarding individual students and employees in an appropriate manner. We thank you for respecting the privacy of our students and employees by following this rule. District 186 streams board meetings on YouTube and all content posted there is subject to YouTube's content guidelines. Springfield Public School District 186 continues to encourage public comment 
and statements made by speakers during public comments do not represent the views or opinions of the Board of Education or Springfield Public School District 186. Having said that, we do have one comment, or is there anybody yes, else? No. Okay. Um, we have uh, Ms. Lynette Ware on uh, parental concerns. So if you'd like to come up to the podium. Ms. Ware, you'll have three minutes, and the countdown will start on the screen up here once you start. <clears throat> because I do believe there's a conflict of interest in your office. Some of you guys have kids that go to the same school that my kids go to school with. So you might think this principal is a great principal. Some of the administrators have husbands that work at the school that my kids go to. So she, this administrator, may be a great boss to that husband. But this administrator, my daughter, was sitting in the cafeteria. And she didn't put up a chair. And they waited until Friday on the 25th to stop my daughter from eating, sent her to a disciplinary room. My daughter calls me up crying, oh, mom, mom. I'm like, what? <clears throat> Not the first time my kids called me up crying. They stand that I can't eat in the cafeteria and I got a detention. I'm like, baby, you gonna eat in that cafeteria. Okay, they can give you a detention for not putting up your chair. But we ain't doing this Jim Crow era, and we ain't doing separate but eat. You go to that cafeteria tomorrow, and you eat like the rest of the kids. So my baby went to that cafeteria. That's time. I'll be back for this. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Matt. I will also say that uh, we spoke about this situation, and I it's did talk involved. to the superintendent and Mr. Scott about it. Thank you. Okay, um, 9.1, presentations to the board. Literacy Tier 2 and Tier 3 curriculum recommendations. Superintendent Gill. All right. I'll ask Ms. Havener Ms. Gordon to come up to the stands. Um, to present tonight. We are going to hear a presentation on literacy tier two and tier three uh, curriculum. We heard a lot of tonight in previous um, presentations about our new math curriculum really making a turn for our students. And at a previous board meeting um, in March, we adopted benchmark advance and my perspectives um, with for elementary and middle school respectively. Uh, the curriculum that you're here about tonight <coughs> is material that 
is the overall focus of literacy instructions who need additional supports beyond that tier one instruction. This adoption will bring us full circle uh, with our overall literacy supports for our students. And the goal of these materials is to think about how we support all of students with tier one, but also make sure that we have the right supports in place for tier two. Um, Ward Lehman is our director, executive director of our student support services. Thank you for the work that you've done to help uh, really support our work and getting this curriculum ready to roll. Um, I really feel that our district is bar none in the work that we do for our students. And we want to make sure that we have all the materials that we need. This is the right time to do that, right when we're bringing in the other literacy curriculum that we have a full comprehensive literacy support program for students who may be also struggling with Tier 1 instruction and need some more focused uh, literacy supports. So I'll turn it over and we can hear a little bit more about these two programs. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having us. I think you took care of everything, so... I'm done. Good <laughs> <laughs> question. Off to a good start. But thanks for having us tonight. My name is Mary Havener. I'm the teacher on special assignment for inclusive practices and ELA curriculum with student support services. And I'm Tracy Gordon. I'm the special education department chair. And I support the curriculum for secondary programs. And so please know that everything that we share tonight is, although we're just two representatives from Student Support Services, it is a complete team approach. It really is work that is um, in an effort to move forward with some actionable items that came from the Dyslexia Task Force last year and that collaborative team that worked throughout the school year. So we'll share that as we move on. So our agenda for tonight is we're gonna give a little bit of background on, on what our, how we established our purpose and how it kind of all got started. We will outline our criteria that we use to uh, review different programs, and we'll talk about how we, our focus group and how we got together um, to support the work and review materials and how that led to our recommendations. So all of the work that we're going to be sharing with you is grounded in what we do as special educators, but it's also closely intertwined with the role of our colleagues that are reading interventionists as well throughout the district. So this work has really focused on carrying out some of those actionable pieces that came from the Dyslexia Task Force that worked last year collaboratively to think about the pieces that were missing and what we needed to move ourselves forward to benefit all of our students particularly those that are our most struggling readers. So it also comes out of the need that we have for some fluidity and consistency across our entire <coughs> system to make sure that we have that in place from elementary through middle school. Yeah, so we started uh, by conducting a needs assessment. We surveyed the K-8 instructional special education teachers to kind of find out what they saw as the, uh, the most critical areas of reading that, are, that is needed for their students. And 100% of those teachers identified as foundational skills, word recognition, and language comprehension as the most critical areas of need. Um, additionally, they identified vocabulary and fluency as areas of need, and then just to take note that they did indicate the ongoing need of professional development. So then more in regards to the purpose behind all of the work that we've done so far, it's really driven by information that's included in both the Illinois Comprehensive Literacy Plan and the Dyslexia Handbooks. Both of these pieces of material were distributed by the Board of Education, or excuse me, the State Board of Education throughout this um, current school year. And they're really closely connected, these two documents, and then they're also driven by the latest and strongest research that we have available. Um, for reading instruction. And throughout those guidance documents, the multi-tiered systems of support, or MTSS, are outlined as being necessary components for us to have and have implemented across all of our grade levels. So we know that the structure is designed to be proactive and preventative, and it's a framework then that operates heavily with data and instruction, and instruction that is informed and impacted by that data. We also know that if we actually implement this process well, it should improve teacher effectiveness and equip teachers with those, those um, strategies and tools that they need to be able to address those need areas. 
That process, though, overall, is completely dependent upon us having evidence-based interventions available to our students in need. Students have to have those interventions at every tier of the structure. And since tier two and three are all layered into tier one, they're always additive in nature. They're never taking anything away from that core curriculum. So we have to consider what we have available across our entire system. And that becomes much, a much more collaborative effort. Since all of our students are all of our students, we have to collaborate in that endeavor. And that means all of our interventionists and our special education teachers have to have access to these evidence-based interventions that have that measure to be intensified as needed as well. So another step in our road for making this decision and this recommendation was looking at our data across the board. And it's reflected in the data that we're going to share with you this evening. The first snapshot of data comes from the Early Reading Benchmark Screener, which is part of our dipstick measure that came from the Dyslexia Task Force, utilizing it in kindergarten and first grade. It's a universal screener that we utilize and administer at three different times throughout the school year. And the data that you see here is a combination of all kindergartners and first graders in the district. 64% of them presented at some or high risk during the winter administration of the assessment. This increased from the fall administration by 12%, which is an increase of 233 additional students falling into those two categories. So we also provided in this slide just a snapshot of our reading map data. And Julie, you can hit the next one too. Um, so we looked at third and sixth grade, all students in third and sixth grade, and we also looked at just the sixth grade students with IEPs. And so as you can see, that 56 to 57 percent of third and sixth grade, all students performed at or below the 40th percentile. For students with IEPs in sixth grade, 70 percent approximately performed below the 21st percentile. So all of these data points subsequently have an impact on student support services. Because when we don't have precise instructional interventions available, we end up relying on the special education system. And this is reflected in this last data point that we have to share with you, which is the percentage of students that 3 through 21 that are identified as having an IEP. We are at 21% currently within our district, but the national and state average for students with IEPs 3 to 21 is 15%. And we've been solidly in or about this number for several years, exceeding that state and national average. So all just looking at all this information and data, it really validated our need for reading intervention for our students. Um, so therefore, we decided we needed to establish some criteria and to look at different uh, programs and evaluate different programs. So, you know, so the first criteria is, first and foremost, we wanted materials that were evidence-based or evidence-line. We want to make sure that whatever materials we selected were proven effective across populations. The second criteria is limited teacher lift. Knowing that teachers have limited time available to prepare materials, we wanted to select materials that required very little um, prep or planning, allowing teachers to put their focus more on intentional implementation. And then the third one is variety of supports. As in our survey, the teachers identified PD as a really uh, a need for them. Um, we wanted a program that has a variety of supports offered not only the initial implementation training, but also offers support and coaching throughout the, the implementation process. Next area in the criteria that we wanted to focus on was how we could find materials that would be consistent for us across the entire district, across grade levels, across tiers of instruction. This was really important to us to make sure that that consistency was there so that there was equitable access for everyone for those materials. 
reasonable implementation <coughs> then refers to the time constraints that we function under. There's not a lot of time for us to be able to implement these interventions, so it's really about finding something that is reasonable to implement within the amount of time that we have available. And then finally, it was important for us that the materials selected be connected to the diverse needs that we're representing. We have to improve this process, and to do that, we have to make sure that there's a wide range of ages that are represented to make sure that materials are effective for them, but never insulting or too juvenile in the process. So our work to develop our purpose, analyze our data, and establish our criteria led us to two providers. Really great reading, 95%. This table just provides a quick snapshot of how each company lines up to our criteria. Um, so, I know you guys have a copy of this, but links to that are one pagers that will give you a little more detail in depth about really the receiving and not the So, once we considered data, we considered specific needs, then we developed a focus group that would help us to evaluate those materials. Because improving this process and the implementations of the interventions is really and truly a collaborative effort and it crosses disciplines and it serves all of our students because this is a general education process. So the work inside of tiers two and three really does involve our reading intervention colleagues along with our special educators. So it was important to us that we had a group that was representative of those people. And as Mary said, it was important to really work across disciplines. So therefore, we worked with the literacy team, we worked with the coordinator, uh, we worked with the elementary teacher instructional leaders. We invited uh, six reading interventionists to join our focus group, that, and that each of them represented a different elementary school. And then we also invited um, five elementary special educators and four middle school special ed educators to join our focus group. So after meeting with that focus group and then receiving their feedback and their comments about the two um, different products and providers, it leads us to these program recommendations that we have for you this evening. The elementary buildings across our system, we recommend going with materials from 95% group. They have a significant research base. They're very prescriptive and precise in the nature of the materials and the platform that houses and collects all of that data really helps teams within a building be able to improve their instruction and pinpoint that instruction as needed. There's also a large range of materials that work across all of those tiers and allow for a great deal of consistency in that implementation. So it's recommended more specifically to um, acquire 95 pair, which would be available to every building's reading interventionist and special educator to be able to address those issues that are in the foundational phonemic awareness skills. Then for students who have more decoding needs, the phonics lesson library is recommended for every building's um, reading interventionist and special educator. These are all encompassing lessons. They have everything needed within the actual system and provides them with five days worth of lessons to move throughout the week. We would also recommend that the supplementary piece for um, the phonics chip kit be added to each one of the buildings to have access to, to give them those opportunities for reteaching, which can often be necessary with our um, kids in need in tier two and three. The final recommendation, you can go back one more. Yeah, two. Sorry. Thank you. The final recommendation is um, for 95 RAP, which is a tier three based intervention. This fills a gap for us that we currently do not have anything to meet these particular needs. This would be an intervention that would be utilized for our students who are our most struggling readers. This would be the very tip of that MTSS triangle for students who are significantly impacted by things like dyslexia or characteristics of dyslexia. It is highly focused, it is very specific, and it's an approach that requires the implement to be specifically trained by trainers from the International Dyslexia Association. This is not an intervention for many. It is very specific and for a very small population that it would serve. But it does, like I mentioned, fill that gap for something that we currently do not have. Okay, so for our middle school instructional ELA uh, classrooms, we are recommending uh, products from really great reading. 
this is in addition to the core program that we recently adopted, My Perspectives. And the programs that I'm recommending for our middle schools are BLAST, Boost, and HD Word, would be a combination of those. And all of these materials are age and grade appropriate interventions that provide targeted instruction in the foundational reading skills. Uh, the lessons are explicit, they're multi-sensory, they're <coughs> and they follow a detailed scope and sequence. The lessons can be delivered in short increments of time, so it makes it very doable with, and meets that criteria of reasonable implementation. And the materials are, all, are also all-inclusive. It comes with everything the teacher needs. Teacher guides, the online presentation tools, the student uh, workbooks, student letter tile kits, and online student access. The final product from Lily Drake Reading is Infocabulary. This, is, this Infocabulary provides vocabulary instruction through an online platform. Students spend 10 to 20 minutes a day working on it. Um, teachers can assign the words or vocabulary based on literature titles that the students are reading in class, um, by novels, uh, by different subjects, you know, science, social studies, or they can just choose the tier three <coughs> vocabulary words. It can be implemented whole group, small group, or as an independent activity. And as we think about implementation for these materials across the system, it is our intention to be very specific and intentional over multiple years with this implementation. Since PD and that support was so important to our teachers. Our goal is to begin the training for the materials as early as possible with respect to our colleagues that are in the balanced calendar schools and their start date in the summer. And of course, we would also be mindful of our literacy colleagues for the scheduling of those dates because it needs to be addressed that the core curriculum will also have training occurring over the summer. And then planning for us to consider how we will then catch up other colleagues that might not be available for summer trainings as well once the school year does get started. Then also, trainings would occur throughout that 24-25 school year as coaching and supports would be embedded and provided with each of those materials. And then, other materials have a self-paced approach where teachers can then initiate that training and do that on their own. So when we look more specifically at the professional development that is available, for 95% group, there is a specific initial training where school-based teams would follow through on that together. So that would be a launching intervention groups training that would occur in one day where the entire school team would be coached through that entire process, utilizing the diagnostic, how to utilize the data dashboard, how to pinpoint the areas for instruction, and so forth. And then, supports would then return and coach through that school year. And then 95 RAP would have a self-paced instructional format where teachers would then initiate that process and have one year to complete it. And there are coaching visits that are incorporated in that as well once the instruction begins so that it's really closely monitored on its implementation. So with really, go back to Sorry. So with really great reading, the initial training is asynchronous takes about three to four hours uh, to complete, and throughout the year, teachers participate and complete other asynchronous um, incremental PD. Uh, we've also scheduled some other opportunities for virtual PD, and then on-site implementation support. So all of the work that we're focused on and the materials that we're recommending tonight are really highly prescriptive and intense, and they're all things that we need to be implemented to support our students that are struggling and to help make up any ground that may have been lost. The materials and the process that were recommended are steeped in research, and it's crucial, especially when we're focusing on that instruction for students with the greatest level of need in that tier two and three of our MTSS system. But those evidence-based materials alone aren't enough, so we have to be really intentional about how we're implementing them, how we're consistently supporting them, communicating in them and making sure that there's consistency across our entire system to make sure that we can get those intended outcomes from these strengthy and, and linking materials. 
So when we take a peek at projected budgets, looking at the materials and things from 95%, it's reflective of enough materials to meet the needs of reading interventionists and special education resource teachers across all of our elementaries. Then, there are no consumables for 95%, so there isn't anything to anticipate in future costs to replenish um, those materials or any items like that. And PD and the coaching and training are all included in that price. And with really great reading, um, it does, the quote does include all teacher and student materials, including the consumables um, as well as the PD. There will be enough materials for every ELA instructional special education teacher and any every student enrolled in that those classes. What questions can we answer? Um, there's quite a difference in price point between these two. Um, are we going to have to replenish any of the materials or anything with the really great reading program? And part of the significant difference is that the 95% group is covering all 21 elementaries then for reading interventionists and special educators, whereas really great reading is going to focus only on the classes for students with IEPs. So a smaller group. Gotcha. Thank you. So talk a little bit about processes with your the team that got together and looked at these. like. You know, from where, who, et cetera, because I know that, you know, we're a very large district. You know, did everybody get to have eyes or did everybody understand or did everybody get to take a peek and how did that work? So I kind of want to understand that. Yes. So I'm we, all about processes. We left those, yeah, we left those things open. We did then also collaborate with our colleagues in the literacy department to make sure that we were selecting <coughs> individuals that would make for a good representation across the elementaries, especially because we had just pulled people for the core yeah. um, adoption process so that we had a variety of eyes that were on that. Um, so we looked at it from those perspectives as well, as well as incorporating then our special education resource teachers so that we could look at it from two different angles. We were able to give them digital samples of things and, and gave them the opportunity to come see things that they so chose, but we gave them all the digital copies, we gave them all of the research so that they could review it and analyze all those pieces. Then we gave them um, a tutorial on how to use the criteria and looking at each one of the pieces that we were narrowing in on, but then also gave them um, a way that they could rank them, ask their questions, concerns, and things like that. Yeah, we, we did set up presentations, virtual presentations from both conferences. Okay, and so then the committee consisted of different support teachers across the district or yeah, yes from that last slide that's in the presentation um, the TI the elementary TILs uh, the Mrs. Metzke was with us the interventionist mm -hmm. six interventionists okay and then, um, middle school and elementary and elementary and we also had prior to the focus group posted an open house where they could come through and look at those materials that they're so I didn't ask this question when when the group was here talking about core, but it, as a as a mom of a special needs kid, now I have a different kind of question. I got a different hat on. Yeah. So, um, do these curriculum and maybe they don't overall, and I should go out and create curriculum, right? Because this is what I would do. Um, are, is there a family incorporation or? Um, uh, liaisoning, for lack of a better word, between what the curriculum is doing at school and what I can be doing at home. I do think that uh, over my years of trying to, you know, get my own special needs kid into reading, etc., that was because I wasn't sure what I should be doing and I wanted to do something. And I, you know, there was a lot of just read 20 minutes a day and that'll be great. And it's like, well, I feel like I should be doing more than that. Um, and not every parent is that way. I get it. Like, I'm probably, you know, 60 on the 0 to 60 scale. I totally understand that. But there are parents I know who want to help at home or mirror what's happening at school at home. Do these programs allow that or incorporate that? Or it's, can you? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it, it is an excellent point because you never want to be undoing any work that's been done. You right. You want to be doing things to reinforce what's actually happening. And so 
each one of them does have because of, I'll speak to 95% specifically, because of that phonics lesson library, there are a multitude of pieces that happen across that week's worth of lessons from different decodable passages and books and word lists and phrases and sentences that are going to be and can be utilized in a lot of different ways. And those can all go home to then create that direct link. There isn't anything specific like a family letter or you know anything that I've noted so far to this point, but I think it's a valid uh, question to have put before us to think of how that communication can be bolstered and how those that avenue can be utilized. For that. I think the that's the, are there. yes. I think that's especially true for parents that have special needs kids and have IEPs right. and we're sitting in meetings every year, et cetera. We're kind of tuned into that for sure. But I also think for our core curriculum, it also plays a role in the connection between home and school and how families can assist their young readers into developing even you know better skills. Absolutely. And I think one really strong point for both 95% specifically, but then it, it, does, it is reflected in really great reading as well, they dovetail and match up completely with the letters training that reading interventionists and special ed resource teachers are going through currently. And because they match up so nicely, it really helps us to be able to put those things into play and to be able to communicate those aspects and to be able to share those aspects more freely and more confidently, I think, with families because of that understanding. So if I was a student that was in a mainstream classroom and was was heard the reading lesson in the in that classroom, but then was pulled for extra support, I would still have that connection. I'm not doing something entirely different. Yes, absolutely. And that was a part of our goal in creating that criteria was to make sure that whatever we found would act as a support and never to take away. Because that is that is a beautiful a thing. Problem for us as special educators is that we're talking a different language or sharing right. a different you know, picture cue or a different prompt, but this would help to solidify all of that and keep us consistent across the board. Thank and you. Middle school in our instructional special ed classrooms really were, we're taking this opportunity to, to address those foundational skills that we know my perspective isn't going to. So it's kind of a two-pronged curriculum that we build. Well, I think that's really helpful in the middle school classrooms where, where help pushes in so that that everybody's having the same situation, but I might need a little extra from my support that's pushed in. And both interventions are based on diagnostic yeah. assessments. Yeah. So it's, it is a every student will be pulled out for this, but it's based on diagnostic. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, look, I don't know if it's a question for uh, administration or uh, Mr. Miller, um, with the, the $2.5 million, I mean, obviously we know that these are supports. So is this, um, you know, as we come into budget time, is this something that is already built into the budget that we have supports already, or is this going to be a new, a new cost? Yeah, they're, they're costs that are built into the budget. Um, we'll use some great money for that. Um, Thank you. Any other discussion? I, I just want to applaud the both of you for, um, and everybody for doing a deep dive into this issue. And uh, I think, you know, I'm having a flashback to, you know, Dr. Moody when we were all talking about this, the whole board. Um, the thing that, that I feel more optimistic about now is we have these targeted areas we know that we have to drill. We know we have to do better with the dyslexia screenings, um, getting our third and fourth graders uh, you know, up to a higher standard, but also just drilling the phonemic awareness and some of the older methods that uh, newer science can also help bolster. So, um, you know, I feel like Unfortunately, us and so many of the, the rest of the nation had to wait for enough time to see the data and throwing COVID into the middle of it was just another outlier that you, you couldn't necessarily point to the curriculum. You know, it could have been all of the disruptions, but now we know, we know better, we're gonna do better. And um, yeah, I feel optimistic about this and I appreciate all of your hard work. Thanks.
Okay, 10.1, business reports. Director Miller. Uh, thank you, President Miller, Superintendent Gill, and members of the board. Tonight's business report will provide a recap of where we stand with outstanding state payments as of March 31st, 2024, and the cash roll forward for the capital projects fund as of February 29th, 2024. Outstanding payments for the state of Illinois for FY24 totaled $2,353,092.52 as of March 31st, 2024. Driver's education program totaled $61,463.48. There is also $420,283.48 due to special projects. There is $10,435.24 of outstanding state payments for the state free lunch and breakfast food service funding and $1,860,910.32 for the transportation fund reimbursement. The cash roll forward detail of our capital projects, fund revenues and expenditures incurred during the month of February 2024 is as follows. This is also a report of the sales tax revenue and separate bond transactions within the capital improvement. Capital project cash flow forward review shows a starting balance of $153,757,581.29. February sales tax receipt of $1,184,613.89 were reported for the November collection period. Bond draws and expenses for this period came to $3,166,464.93, while dividends and interest for the period resulted in $628,070.25, with an ending balance of $152,403,800.30. Additionally, for my business, my business report, I wanted to update you on the district's health insurance plan. Tomorrow, we are set to hopefully have our final insurance meeting. Uh, we have previously planned to bring a presentation to you this evening with a vote to be held on 422, but we have found this task to be a very difficult one. We will bring a presentation for you uh, at the uh, 422 meeting and then we'll have a vote on that same night. Um, and I will send you that information uh, before we get to that uh, 422 meeting and I will get that to you electronically. Um, we want to thank President Miller, Coxell, who is a third party uh, provider, and the committee uh, that is made up of local bargaining units, including SEA, Local 15, PTSP, and SBAA, for some very long meetings and interactive discussions on these very complex topics. We have been working to make sure that those employees with families on our insurance plan do not get overly burdened. We want to make sure that the committee have the option to put money towards certain plans if they are needed. The superintendent and I have worked hard to understand how to best help our plan, consider our overall budget, and make sure that our employees feel supported in a time when there is a major escalation in costs in the insurance industry across the nation. We feel the best way to do this is to put more district money into the overall plan that is outlined in the employee contracts to offset this burden that exists due to insurance cost increases. Tomorrow, we will finalize that opportunity to the committee so they, they can help decide how to utilize that extra money. This will be part of a plan for one year only, as next year, we will go out for a bid for a new health insurance provider and head into negotiation with our employee group. That's a brief update for you for our health insurance. Um, President Miller, members of the board, this does conclude the business report for April 8, 2024. Do you have any questions that I can answer? I do want to also say thank you for all the hard work that you and your team have done uh, with the health insurance plan also. It's, um, it is a lot of work and I do feel uh, the duty to say, you know, this, this is a very frustrating conversation because this is something that's kind of out of all of our hands. We're just trying to do the best that we can so it's, it's not anybody's fault. It's just a very tough math problem. and. I think I've kind of explained that to some of the other board members whenever we've casually talked about this. It's every year it keeps going in one direction and it's not getting cheaper. So I'm looking forward to the conversation tomorrow and to seeing some of the solutions on the table.
right, hearing no other discussion, uh, we probably need to move to 10.2, the audit presentation. I'll do that is you, Superintendent. Superintendent Gill, President Miller, and members of the board, I would like to introduce Scott Denzer from Whipley LLP. He will present our draft ACFR and be available for any questions after his presentation. Good evening. Thanks for uh, having me and I'll, uh, to uh, discuss the uh, audit process, the report we're preparing, and I'll try and answer any questions you have uh, afterwards or stop me any time uh, if the need uh, strikes you. I uh, just want to talk a little bit about the annual comprehensive financial report, uh, same report we've issued in prior years. This is the gold standard in financial report for the, uh, it's the most comprehensive, thorough, uh, presentation <coughs> the district can put together and uh, put out to the public to get the all kinds of financial information plus a whole bunch of statistical information. So you, the district's actually going above and beyond what um, the regulatory requirement, the basic regulatory requirement is. Um, so I just wanted to say that uh, out front. I'll touch on a few um, highlights in the financial statements. Um, and then some other information as I go through the report. Just want to say, last year this report, the 2022 report, was submitted to the Association of, Association of School Business Officials, um, and they uh, and it won the certificate of, certificate of excellence in financial reporting. So that just means that it has all the information that's needed in a proper format. It doesn't it doesn't uh, talk about any kind of financial performance. It's just about presentation uh, that this, this, this format of the report uh, meets the standards uh, set up by the Association of School Business Officials. This is a draft report that you see in front of you. We are very close to finishing up, um, uh, putting our opinion on it. Uh, I don't anticipate any material changes on it. There are a couple of audit areas we still are looking at a, a little bit of information a little bit more analytical review, and then um, our internal certification. So we expect to get this uh, finished up in a final format extremely soon. Uh, there's just a couple of um, uh, I's and that T's across. And we'll, but like I, like I mentioned, uh, there's no, uh, there shouldn't be any material differences in the numbers. Also anticipate we'll issue an unmodified or clean opinion on these financial statements that we had in the past, and I don't expect any material weaknesses that be reported. When you go through the statements, there's really a, the, 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 <coughs> the annual comprehensive financial report really reports two separate types of financial statements, government-wide financial statements and fund financial statements. I'll start with the government-wide financial statements real quick. Those are all encompassing. They take all the district's funds or squeeze them together add in capital assets or fixed assets, all the debt, bond debt, pension debt, in the one, one financial statement. Uh, so it's a whole, whole encompassing. At the end of 2020, June 30, 2023, the, the equity in the government by financial statements was about $24 million. Uh, this is the first year in many a year that it finally went to a positive number. Uh, so that means that the, the overall financial condition of the, of the district is approved. It's, it's very common for a lot of districts to have negative net position, negative equity in the government financial statements. Reason being is the, all the unfunded or the pension liabilities, OPEP liabilities, on the other post employment stuff, the liabilities, and that's why a lot of districts in the negative uh, ec equity in the government financial statements. The second sort of set of financial statements in here are the governmental fund financial statements. These funds are set up right by ISP guidelines. Uh, these are for the day-to-day -day operating funds. <coughs> this is how you buy, you buy funds, how you budget. So these are more of the day-to-day. -day. Um, for the year end of June 30, 2023, the, um, the governmental fund balance went down about $50 million. But We'll have to take into account that 67 million was really the capital projects funded by working cash funds. Okay, so, so if you take that out, you know, take the capital items, which are not operating and recurring and things, you really had um, a positive income less the capital projects. Um, there were a couple new 
as always, our one new governmental accounting standards this year related to this, uh, subscription based information technology agreements. So we had to sort of analyze the, the contracts we had related to the software, stuff like that, for financial accounting, you know, all kinds of you know, financial related software, technology related software. Um, we did have to add a, some capital assets there to start depreciating. So that's going to be new that was added into the financial statements. Uh, this year there's no debt related to that. Uh, when we analyze them, there are certain requirements that have to be met for them to be considered debt leases almost, but, they're, but they're, they didn't meet that requirement. Coming up for 2024, there's a new standard related to compensated assets, a new government accounting standard for compensated assets. Will have, I don't think it will have any effect on any of our clients because that's related to like accrued vacation and stuff like that. The district doesn't you know, provide that for the future, obviously. So that shouldn't be any, any effect um, moving forward to that. Um, you know, well, when I was going through the, uh, or, you know, just some just some other things, some maybe some some observation I've seen that, you know, as I go to a lot of board meetings. And I'm reviewing the reports too. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of um, a lot of difficulty maybe coming on the horizon here. You're going to have a lot of ESSER, the ESSER funding from the federal funding is going to stop. That's going up. That's going away. Inflation is always a concern. That's the cost of use. The costs are going up. The insurance benefits, insurance supplies across the board. So it's putting it more and more difficult. It's almost a swing from, you know, during at the height of COVID, a lot of my districts were in pretty good shape. They were lots of money and their expenses were out. It sort of swung the other way now. So it's really going to be a little tighter maybe. But of course, well, that's something to be just, you know, aware of. Um, another thing is related to, and this is, uh, we do have information here on, uh, starting on page 55, related to pension liabilities and that kind of thing. So, you know, the, you know, the, the, the teacher's retirement system pension liability for the district is on page 55. We have a schedule. That's about $9.6 million of a liability that's on the district books, responsible. But there's a state portion, too. And that portion, just as of June 30, 2023, was $840 million. So those are real numbers. They're not on your books, but they're, you know, because it's a state liability. But they're really out there. So it's something we can spend about the time to One of the good things about putting that act for together in the act section starting on page around 82 or so, there's a whole bunch of 10 years statistical tables. And one of them is related to that position that I talked about a little bit earlier in the government like financial statements. And it shows that you know a trend going up there. And I mentioned you're at 24 billion positive in that position this year. And I've seen it improving over the last five or six years. It <coughs> goes up. So that means your overall the district is getting better in better financial uh, position. Uh, there was a big, in, if you look at 2016-2017, there was a big drop off. That's when, it, that's when the OPEP liability hit almost hit on $100 million went on your books that year in the Illinois financial statement. So, but ever since then, it's been improving and going on. So, um, uh, I just want to thank uh, Steve for his help uh, getting this done. Um, uh, it's always a lot of work putting it together, a lot of coordination. A lot of, because of the, the, the information comes from a lot of different sources, a lot of different people, and a lot of, a lot of areas, not just internally from the district, but a lot of external sources also. So, I appreciate uh, you having me here to just to talk a little bit about the process. I'm glad to answer any questions tonight or later on. I'm always available um, to be reached and talk to uh, anything financially related. One other thing I just wanted to mention that came to mind, in addition to the ACFR, we also prepare the, the annual financial report. It's called for ISB. It's a regulatory report. Every district in Illinois fills out the same report. <coughs> And as part of it, and then ISP can take it to add and do well number crunching or whatever, comparison ratios, whatever. But as part of that form, they per, they provide a financial profile summary score 
Uh, this is based on a 4.0 scale, and it takes a bunch of ratios, fund balance to revenue, expenditures to revenue, days of cash on hand, and uh, like that, that margin remaining. And the highest score you can get is a 4.0. The district right now is at a 3.7. It's still in a recognition range, which is the highest level you can get. So the, 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 the two areas that you don't get the perfect 4, four score is a long-term debt compared to the margin and base cash on hand. Scores are two and three respectively. So that is all I have for you tonight. If I can answer any questions. No, that's good. Does anybody have any questions? Any board members? Um, Thank you for your work on this. It's so so the, the bottom line, the takeaway is we're, we're in good shape. <laughs> you're not the best one ever seen, you're not the worst, but like I said, there's... I'll take it three points. You know, there's, there's definitely things coming up, headwinds for you that you should be aware of, uh, you know, moving forward, and it's going to be a little difficult to just be And so that, that was going to be my next point. You know, I, I have to credit a lot of people that were here before I was involved with the Board of Education. <clears throat> there were a lot of people that did some heavy lifting to get us into a positive financial situation and um, some of the things you hit on about the ESSER funding going away, the, uh, inflation, the cost of doing business increasing. We just talked about health care being at an all-time high. I think that's part of the reason why Myself and so many other board members, Mr. Mars included, you know, look at the bottom line. You know, we just talked about an expensive um, curriculum that's going to help our, our reading scores, but it all has to work into the big puzzle of keeping us financially solvent. So um, I, I appreciate all the effort you put into this report and um, also to Director Miller for, for all of your hard work, too. So thank you. Stay on the topic of, of finances, 10.3, uh, <coughs> FY23-24 amended budget report. Yeah, this is the <coughs> time of year where we take our current budget and look at how we've done in each of the various line items and then amend our budget for the rest of this fiscal year. And then we'll also be getting ready for the next budget that we'll go into. So, Mr. Miller, I'll turn it over yet again to you. All right. Thank you, Superintendent Gill, President Miller, and members of the board. I present to you the FY24 amended budget. Um, the business department has the opportunity of each year to amend the original budget that we passed in September. This allows the district to better align the budget based on revenues and expenditures that we have reported through this past year. For spring trail, this process does play, take place each spring and is voted on in either May or June. Uh, following our school code guidelines, we do have a certain timeline that we have to stick to. And so that is up on the screen right now. We are planning to have our public hearing and our vote on May 6th. And according to school code, we need to have that budget available to the public one, 30 days in advance. So on April 5th, that was made available in our uh, district office. Tonight we are doing the presentation to the board, so I can go over the amended budget with you. And then we will have two board meetings before we, we vote. So on April 22nd, um, I can answer any questions that we can have in the discussion about uh, the amended budget if we have more discussion after tonight's presentation. Also, just uh, heading you back to our, our audit with Mr. Uh, Denzer. Uh, if you do have questions for him, please email those to me and I will uh, either answer them or have faith with him. And then on the April 22nd board meeting, we can also uh, answer those questions for the audit. All right, so as we look at the operating <laughs> fund budget, and again, operating fund includes the education fund, operations and maintenance, and transportation fund. Um, these numbers are representative of our expected position of the district on June 30th of 2024. Uh, the report, these numbers do not include our special project grants. Uh, those grants are paid as flow through and um, are just not included in this operating fund budget because they are always, um, they are always bound to budget. Revenues for the amended budget are 195.3 million. That is up from 194 million in the original budget. 
And expenditures for the amended budget are 204.5 million, and that's up from 204.4 million. The expected revenues have increased by 1.27 million dollars since the end of the budget. That's good news. We've brought in more money than we were ever expecting. While the expected expenditures have only increased by 114,000, so our expected revenues have uh, outpaced our expected revenue increase uh, through this year. We will see how that will affect our uh, projected deficit on the next slide. Um, just as in the original budget, we did leave in the contingency that we built into the budget and some of those extra monies. Um, that way we could still compare our budget, our amended budget, to our tentative budget and that 95% trend. So I wanted to keep that consistent so we can keep track of that 95% because that's the charts that I show you at the second board meeting each month. Just so we can kind of uh, see where we're at, we remember back to the last board meeting, we had that big spike in expenditures, and that was because we had a free payroll month in February. Um, I ran the numbers just last week for March, and those lines came back together. So it's kind of like we were thinking, so we're kind of right on track again. In the original budget, there was a deficit of $10.4 million, and that's why we were doing that 95% trend line. And there was an estimated fund balance for June 30th of 22.7%. In the amended budget, because we had that spike in revenues, that um, projected deficit has lowered to $9.2 million. And we will have a calculated uh, budget fund balance of 22.8% as of June 30th of 2024. If we break this down by um, our major funds, we'll first look at the Ed Fund. Revenues in the Ed Fund were $161.4 million. This was an increase of $1.1 million. Our expenditures were $169.2 million, and that was a decrease of $285,000. Uh, the Ed Fund, there will be a projected deficit of $7.7 .7 million. Again, we hope to make that up with that 95% trend line. And a projected fund balance of $26.5 million. In our Operation and Maintenance Fund, revenues were just under $19 million. This was an increase of almost $300,000. And expenditures are just over $20 million, and this was an increase of $850,000. Lots of things went into that increase. We had um, a couple vehicles that were totaled during the year, so we had to replace those. We had some extra expenses in uh, custodial staff as we were preparing to open uh, land here. So things that we just needed to do um, and weren't necessarily budgeted in June, but we can make sure we're, we're uh, paying for those. So we do have a projected deficit of $1 million and a projected fund balance of $3.9 million. In the transportation fund, our revenues are $14.8 million, and this was a decrease of $108,000. Our expenditures are $15.3 million, and that's a decrease of $414,000. We do have a projected deficit of $503,000 and a fund balance projection of $4.5 million. Though not in um, the operating funds, we do need to look at the IMRF fund and the TORC fund because they do affect our AFR financial profile that um, Mr. Zinder was just talking about. In the IMRF fund, uh, these are our retirement funds. Uh, revenues were 7.21 million, expenditures were 7.19 million. This is a surplus of $22,000. And we have a projected fund balance of $2.1 million. In our tort fund, uh, so tort fund deals with anything security, insurance related and legal uh, activity. The revenues were 6.12 million. Expenditures are projected to be 6.59 million. A deficit of 473,000 and a fund balance of 475,000. This concludes the FY24 amended budget presentation. The budget is on file at the district office and we will have a, a public hearing on the amended budget on May 6th of 2024, at which time we will also have the vote to approve the budget. At this time, do you have any questions? And just to remind you, we will have time for questions at the end of the second. I think one of the ultimate questions always, and maybe you could clarify it just so that we can hear it for the group, the difference between fund balance and deficit. 
just if we have a deficit, why do we still have a fund balance? I think just explain that. Sure. So it's our a fund balance school. would be our savings account. So every fund has a fund balance. Uh, we have our nine funds from Ed, transportation, some funds you don't hear about very often, like capital projects. Each of those have a fund balance. Um, some of those fund balances can be shifted to other places. So we might be able to take some Ed fund savings account and move that over to transportation if we needed to, or IMRF. Uh, some funds. Some fund balances cannot be shifted to other places. There's all sorts of rules and regulations on those. But those are our savings accounts. So um, when we operate, just like in our home, um, if we are operating at a deficit in a month, we have to build into our savings account. So anytime we operate at a deficit, we're, we're going into our fund balance, we're going into our savings account. So the, the goal is to operate at a zero base belt, uh, a budget. So we have zero deficit, and we know our any surplus. So we can uh, really hone in on how much money we'll have extra at the end of the year or how much we're going to take out of our savings account. Yeah. Thanks for all your stuff today. A lot. It's a lot. <laughs> you can stop coming up yeah. to my office now. I know. <laughs> no, thank you for the hard work. I'm, I'm sure I'll have more questions. I'll just reach out on the side. It's been spreadsheet month. Okay, so we'll move along to consent action items. Superintendent. Certainly. President Miller, uh, members of the board, I recommend approval of consent action 11.2 through 11.13 as described in the corresponding resolutions. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I feel like a lot of these projects we've already talked about. Yeah, I think, you know, probably the biggest one is 11.6, the Springfield High Additions and Renovations. Bid release number two. Uh, this is the second of three large bid releases we will do for the Springfield High Additions and Renovation projects. Uh, this really enables the work of doing a lot of the initial site things that we need to do, initial storm sewer relocations. We're doing additional site logistic uh, work. Uh, beginning the selective demolition of walls, floors, ceilings on the north wing of the building in the summer of 24, installation of material um, for all three major floors of the building for demolition and construction operations, uh, relocating main gas lines for future demolition of the 1965 Dewey Gymnasium, and then installation of temporary HVAC so that we can do the um, kind of do the demolition of the existing. Uh, fan room, and then relocation of electrical switch gear from the lower level to the first level, and refeeding the panels and allowing for demolition of several buildings. Um, you know, the OSHA has estimated a cost for this work prior to receiving bids is about five million um, and some change. But after receiving bids, our GMP for this work will be five point three million dollars. And this is like you like you're saying the real work at the building. Mm -hmm. This is getting things prepped We're getting for. in there, yes. Okay. We did a full walkthrough of a break, um, just looking at everything uh, that we need to do, and it was it was eye-opening and, like, nerve-wracking all at the same time. But it's going to be awesome um, when it's all completed, just like we've seen at Lanfear High School. I get to go uh, to Lanfear and do a walkthrough of the new project or the new areas that are being developed tomorrow. So I'm really excited about that, and I think O'Shea is going to do another one of their video updates so the whole community can see uh, the <coughs> progress that we're doing and I'll have a little spot in that video as well so I'm and, excited that, about and that, that prior bid release was uh, more focused on the properties on the complex is that right the prior bid was yes yeah. this is more about the work that we're going to be doing okay. this summer Just trying getting to keep ready. Them all you always do your bid releases two or three months in advance so we're up to about 18 mm -hmm. million now for the total right okay mm -hmm. well it's moving along exciting stuff yeah. And I think that those are the major things. We did, we did have a bid for Franklin Middle School. Uh, the lowest bidder was John Coe Construction at $1.3 million. And then we also um, did the roof replacement work for Butler Elementary this summer, and that went to Henson Robinson at $140,800. Okay. Right. Um, hearing no other discussion, Ms. Amos, would you please take the roll? Certainly. Austin? Aye. Blissett? Aye. Gilmore? Aye. Imes? Aye. Lil Wolf? Aye. Mars? Aye. Miller? Aye. That is seven I votes. Okay, roll call action items 12.1, approval of personnel recommendations. I'll turn it over to Mr. Miller. Thank you. Uh, 
President Miller and members of the board, the superintendent recommends adoption of the personnel recommendations as uh, with the following changes. Page four, letter E, change of assignment, certified. Number two and number five, please pull from consideration and this will, these will be brought forth at a future board meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Hammers? Austin? Aye. Elicit? Aye. Gilmore? Aye. Imes? Aye. Lil Wolf? Aye. Mars? Aye. Miller? Aye. That is seven our votes. All right, so that uh, just approved our entire personnel agenda, but we have a couple of important people in the crowd to give a little recognition to. In this uh, personnel recommendation, we moved Alicia Miller from interim principal <laughs> Colors. I know you have some people out there to, rec to introduce to us, so your proud family is going to support you along the way. I'm so glad. I'm just excited for this opportunity. The whole staff embraced me. If it wasn't going to be so long, they would they would have been here tonight. But I need them to come to work in the morning. That's right. <laughs> they just was like you had the energy. You give your roar. You do what you do best. And so I have my brother here with me. I have my incredible husband with me. Sixth grader in the pipeline, so we're going to need you to stick around for a little while, okay? I have the energy, I have the time. You want to hear that roar? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, as a Lamphere parent, there I, I don't think that there could have been a better choice. Like, I see the energy that you bring to Lamphere every day. Um, you, you put the fear in my second child, and if you have a second child, you know what I mean by that, okay? You know he called me auntie. I know. I don't know how you manage that, but, uh, you know, whatever. I'll take it, you know. So um, just keep bringing that spirit over to the North End. Um, we love it. Go Lions. And, I, you know, I can't wait to see you around the building, not only as a, as a board member, but as a parent for the next few years. So. And also tonight, we welcome back to our community, Janika Gulley, as the new principal of Matheny with her elementary school. Woo!
education, loving kids. My assistant superintendent from Decatur is here, and it means so much just that he would show his face and come. Um, <laughs> me from day one through all kinds of adversity. Um, but Fantasia, Fantasia Marino said it best, to God be the glory. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, I, am, I am very, very excited about uh, both of the, my big sister, <laughs> Alicia, and Miss Ellie. We are excited to see what's to come, what's going to come. I know that, uh, like you said, to God be the glory. So I know that he has put you here for a reason, and let's let's let's, let's run with it. Let's go. All right. Congratulations, everybody. Uh, that brings us up to 12.2 approval of the preparation of the fiscal year 2025 tentative budget. All right, Mr. Miller, this is your last show. All right, take a breath. <laughs> President Miller, members of the school board, the superintendent recommends the adoption of the following resolution. Be it resolved by the Board of Education of School District Number 186 in the County of Sangamon, State of Illinois, that Ms. Jennifer Gill and Mr. Stephen Miller are hereby appointed to prepare a tentative budget for the said school district for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2024 and ending June 30th, 2025. Which tentative budget shall be filed with the Secretary of the Board? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. Ms. Hammers. Blissett. Aye. Gilmore. Aye. Imes. Aye. Will Wolf. Aye. Mars. Aye. Miller. Aye. Austin. Aye. That is seven minutes. All right, and 12.3 student discipline. President Miller, members of the board, it is my recommendation that one 10th grade student be hereby expelled from further attendance at Southeast High School through the end of the first semester of the 24-25 school year with a program, and that one 9th grade student be hereby expelled from further attendance at Lanphier High School through the end of the 24-25 school year without a program. So Which moved. Means that they got yeah. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Hammers. Uh, Gilmore? Aye. Imes? Aye. Lil Wolf? Aye. Mars? Aye. Miller? Aye. Austin? Aye. Blissett? Aye. That is seven eye votes. Okay, announcements 13.1. Next regular meeting is going to be Monday, April, not Monday, April 8th. What is it, April 22nd? 22nd, yes. April 22nd at 5.30 at a location to be announced because we're not sure if we, the new. We do think we're probably going to be at Fiat. We just have to make sure the work is, everything's in. We think the installation will happen within the next week and a half, and we'll be ready to go. Right. So so fingers we'll, crossed. We'll maybe we'll be at a new location. Uh -huh. Otherwise, we'll see you here at 1900. Yeah. <coughs> Everybody 13. still calls it 1900 in the new building, don't they? <laughs> it's just a thing. It's the thing. <laughs> it's, you know, we are who we are. We're the big, big ass, but yeah. Um, We're really starting to call it Fiat more and more. Oh, good. So 13.2, uh, upcoming district events on April 25th from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. We have kindergarten preview night. Woohoo! So put that on your calendar if you uh, got some youngsters. And then 13.3, freedom of information report is attached to the electronic school board, which brings us to adjournment. Does any board member have any closing business? I have something. Ms. Blissett. Um, I just would like to share something, and I'm not sharing this for any accolades or congratulations but I am 42 years old and I just completed my bachelor's degree and no but let me finish but by just completed I literally mean I just got the diploma in the mail this weekend and if you are out there and you are working towards your degree if you are going back to school do not let anybody tell you that you are less because you didn't get your degree right after high school. That's right. Keep working towards it. It's never too late. You're never too old. There's never, you know, there's always time. You can do it. Congratulations. Uh, I want to shout out Mr. Jamar Scott. Um, on Saturday, there was a very excellent um, convention 
let's call it the state of Black Springfield, and Mr. Jamar Scott held it down, represented 186. So we appreciate you and all your efforts to make our district better. So thank you for representing. Any other board members have anything? Okay, well that brings us to adjournment. Uh, at 8.35, we'll stand adjourned until next meeting. Thank you, everybody.